Yeah. You're on. To be on your best behavior now. Should we start? Yeah, I think um, I think we're gonna start okay. now. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. We're going to start now. Uh, also, since uh, since we're running All right. bit, since we're running a little bit late, uh, let's consider that the break. Or feel free to get up and just get get some food. Uh, so we'll just go right, right into Marcus's talk, and then I'll, I'll go next, and Amy Ireland is after me, and then we'll break for lunch. Uh, so this is Marcus Boone. He teaches contemporary literature and cultural theory at York University. His interests include literature in the digital age, critical theory, the beats, and other alternative and countercultures, sound studies, and the cultural studies of spirituality and religion. He's the, uh, the author of The Road of Excess, a history of writers from Harvard University Press, <coughs> and in Praise of Copying, also from Harvard. Uh, he edited America, Prophecy, The Sparrow Reader, and Subduing Demons in America, uh, the selected poems of John Giorno. Is that right? Uh, but he's currently working on a book. Uh, he writes for The Wire, and he's currently working on a book titled The Politics of Vibration. Hi. Um, thanks to Mark and Eldridge for convening this. Um, I'm in transition between not wearing glasses and wearing glasses, so I'm, I'm sort of in denial about my eyesight. Um, and uh, I'd like to dedicate my, my comments to the memory of Lou Reed, who passed away earlier this week. And although Lou Reed and Catherine Krista Hennix uh, in some sense pursue very different trajectories because of their association with Lamont Young, they, in some sense, their work does come out of the same matrix. So I think it's not totally inappropriate. Okay. So, for, just out of curiosity, how many people have heard um, the electric harpsichord? Is that an instrument or a band? It's piece. a piece of music <laughs> by Henry. Well, I obviously have. <laughs> okay, so just a, just a few. Good. So, I first encountered Catherine Krista Hennix while doing research for an article on the Indian classical music singer Pandit Pramnath, who was the teacher of Lamont Young. And Marion Zazila, Terry Riley, John Hassel, Henry Flynn, and various <laughs> others. We spoke only by phone, and aside from her account of her time with Pranath, the way she talked about music was remarkable and inspiring, echoing what I learned from Lamont Young, but also striking out in many di directions, most of which were completely new to me. Um, Hennix is a Swedish-born mathematician, composer, visual artist, musician, and philosopher who currently lives in Berlin. And for the last few years, I've gone and visited her um, and made a series of interviews that hopefully will become part of a book. Um, Hennix has a very interesting background. In addition to studies with Lamont Young and friendship and collaboration, with philosopher and avant fiddler Henry Flint. She's also taught mathematics at the university level, worked with AI founder Marvin Minsky, and is a close collaborator with Russian dissident mathematician and founder of the School of Ultra Intuitionism, Alexander Essenin Volpin. Um, she's also studied with Lacan's editor in chief disciple, Jacques Alain Miller. And I should say about the previous presentation that she's also a good friend of Marianne Amiche, and I think she said that Amiche turned her on to kind of higher mathematics. Um, in terms of music, she has two bodies of work, one from the late 60s through the early 80s, which spans computer music, drone-based compositions and improvisations. The other, beginning in the early 2000s, 
which involves digitally composed drones, which also form the basis for the improvisations of her group, the Khorasan Time Court Mirage. A number of years ago, Henry Flint played me the electric harpsichord, which is a recording of a solo performance given by Henix in Stockholm in 1976 as part of a multimedia show that included paintings, musical performances, philosophy, and more, and was entitled Grower's Lattice. The piece is about a half hour long, and it blew me away when I heard it, even though Henix told me that it needed to be played at a volume beyond the capability of most sound systems for the overtones in it to really open out. It affected me in a way that was new, surprising. So I think I'd just like to play the first five or so minutes of the piece, and then I'll read um, some thoughts about it in which I uh, address the overlaps between what interests Hennix and the concerns of a speculative philosophy. And just to say, it's a little weird to just play the first five minutes of this because the piece is intended to kind of put you into a trance. And so to cut the trance off just as it's building is kind of weird. Um, to then give a kind of scholarly paper afterwards is even weirder. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we, we do what we can. So. <laughs> That's right. It's computing. It's
<laughs> it kind of had some sort of urge to just drop the written part. <laughs> it's just it's so great to be able to hear it really loud and to actually hear it in a social space with a group of people. It's always, it's kind of like taking drugs together or something. It's, just, it's a convivial thing to do. <laughs> but, um, okay, back to the universe of words. Um, so, a drone is simply a sustained set of tones. While drones can be located in the history of music everywhere, from the tambour-led sound of Indian classical music to the prelude to Wagner's Das Rheingold, Drones become important cultural and active artifacts in their own right in the early 1960s. Whether Lamont Young really created the first drone-based musics, he and the circle of people around him articulated a new way of thinking about them. Young contrasted his work to that of John Cage, which can be said to be truly phenomenological cages in the sense that it is concerned with the way that sound appears to a particular subject in space and time. In contrast to the silence of 4 minutes and 33 seconds, Young's drones fill space and time. They are intensely repetitive. They emphasize a quality of sameness which bifurcates into an experience of difference that still is the repetition of the same. Um, in Young's formula, tuning is a function of time, meaning that as one tunes into particular groups of frequencies within a particular drone sound, further levels of frequency become audible, as well as a sameness that in some sense is always there whether the drone is being played or not. In this sense, one could argue that drones represent a structural response to the Cajun phenomenology of sound. This is particularly true when the production of drones is formulated from within the mathematical paradigm of just intonation. In other words, that only frequencies that obey certain rules that are in accordance with the natural harmonics of sound are used for the composition of drones. And this was Lamont Young's whole thing, right? A drone is a mathematical structure enacted within a particular space by a particular sound-making apparatus, whether mu musicians or machines. Since Tony Conrad, a key figure in this process of mathematization, is known as a structuralist filmmaker, one could equally make an argument that his drones are structuralist too, since they work with an apparently real set of mathematical phenomena that produce certain acoustic physical phenomena when implemented. This picture becomes further complicated by Alain Danielou's work on tuning systems in traditional cultures, which Young and Conrad read in the early 1960s. The upshot of this work is, first of all, the just intonation scales, i.e. scales that can be described using ratios of whole numbers, are the basis of many traditional musics and the particular permutations of particular just intonation scales are associated with particular kinds of affect. Thus, Hindustani raga music associates each raga, which is a combination of a particular scale with a particular set of rules for movement around the scale with a particular mood or feeling. A great raga performance evokes this feeling, which has been described as a living spirit that possesses those who listen to it. This adds important dimensions to the structural nature of just intonation-based musics, since it effectively makes the argument that particular kind of affect or feeling can be described as particular sound forms, which can also be mathematically described. In other words, there is a mathematical structure to feeling. In performance, a raga pulls you into its sound world. It evokes a yearning which could be described as the feeling that the sound and the feeling that it elicits are more real than the apparently real world that exists outside of the performance. But this then raises further questions, which in fact Young, Conrad, 
and others, including Hennix, who worked with them, did ask, and which formed the basis of their work. If traditional musics can be defined in terms of a mathematics of affect, and the basis of that mathematics is the extrapolation of musical scales based on ratios of whole numbers, to what degree does that offer not only a description of traditional musics, but the possibility of an experimental music based on hitherto unheard of scales built around hitherto unarticulated ratios of prime whole numbers? Even the electric harpsichord, which is supposedly based on the scale of Raga Multani, one of the most important Hindustani ragas, clearly involves a reconfiguration of the rules and practices involved in using this scale. Everything I've said so far is probably generically true of the minimalist generation who worked with just intonation and or studied Indian classical music, Lamont Young, Tony Conrad, Terry Riley, and so on. Hennix met Lamont Young in 1970 and studied with him and has been associated with him ever since. But what sets Hennix apart from these figures is the elaboration of a speculative, philosophical, and scientific approach to drone making that goes far beyond the work of the others. You know, and they went pretty far too, I would say. Um, there are two aspects to this. One, the particular theory she comes up with, and two, the uncanny quality of the music and sound pieces she makes. The electric harpsichord is a remarkable piece of music. In many ways, it's unique in my experience in that each time I listen to it at sufficient volume, there's an uncanny feeling of the melting away of the body, of the walls of the room I'm in, of gravity. I'm not even sure what is melting. And I've had my fair share of uncanny experiences of the melting away of the body, and it's not like any of those other ones. <laughs> the recent CD of Hennix's Berlin-based group, the Khorasan Time Court Mirage, although quite different in sound, still manages to do something similar. Why this matters in terms of the topic of this conference is that here is a musician with a theory of the sonic, the vibratory real, who also makes music and sound works that are repeatedly able to demonstrate that which she theorizes. If speculative philosophy's origins can be found in the limits of the linguistic or discursive turn, sound and music obviously arrive as matters that are poorly rendered in and as language. Furthermore, in the shift from musicology to sound studies and from the musical to the sonic, one quickly reaches the limit of correlationism, a world of sounds, frequencies, vibrations that are there, but are not necessarily there for us. Having said that, and being wary of claims of being able to leave the correlationist circle too easily, I wonder whether the charm and power of music doesn't already, and in general, consist in the fact that it is simultaneously inside and outside the correlationist circle. And in answering the question, what is the specific power of music, to say that music opens us up into a vibrational exteriority, a great outdoors, an excess or non-knowledge. Indeed, Bataille's term is useful. Non-knowledge is that aspect of the world that cannot be correlated with our knowledge of the world, but which is nonetheless decisive for us. Non-knowledge can be the object of a practice that plays with, resonates with that object without knowing it. Music, in this sense, accesses or allows us to access the great outdoors. How does it do that? Perhaps here one should speak of Badiou's hypothesis of a mathematical ontology, and then, noting the relationship of mathematics and music, stretching back to Pythagoras and beyond, to observe the connections between a mathematical ontology, a vibrational ontology, and a sonic or even musical ontology. This is in fact a claim that Lamont Young made for his own music when he called it meta-music in the 1960s. Grounded in the notion of the syllable om as the sound of the universe, the universe as a wave or vibration, 
brackets, in Hennix's <coughs> recent work, the Hubble frequency, which he defines as the lowest possible frequency the universe can sustain at any future time. In other words, we are embedded within this frequency. Um, long duration works bring up the question of ancestrality. Hennix writes of her own pieces that they should not be understood as having a beginning and end corresponding to the time of their performance, but that, but that their performance is without end and is merely suspended or made audible and inaudible at certain moments. The specific way in which Hennix understands all of this involves insights from a number of fields, the nature of which has changed over the years. Um, I'll speak of two here, which have been important to Hennix since the 1970s. One, intuitionism. If one is to make the claim that ontology is mathematical, the next thing to observe is that there are important conflicts when it comes to the foundation of mathematics, which is more or less where math mathematical ontology would be found. Already in the 1970s, Hennig spoke explicitly of her music as an intuitionistic modal music. By modal music, we can understand the world of tuning systems, scales, as I've elaborated above. Intuitionism in mathematics is a school of thought founded by the Dutch mathematician Brouwer. Although it is frequently marginalized within the history of mathematics, including in Badiou's representations of it, intuitionism is still acknowledged as being one of the three core modern schools of mathematical thought, the others being formalism, brackets, a number does not represent anything, it is merely a functional element within the system or structure, and Platonism, numbers are real because they are forms that represent or articulate perceivable qualities in everyday life. The core of intuitionism, according to Brouwer, is that mathematical entities such as numbers emerge out of the self-contemplation of the mathematical thinker who Brouwer calls the creative subject, a term which Hennix also adopts, and the experience by this subject of the splitting of time in that self-contemplation, which Brouwer calls the tuity, tuity, past, future, right? All of mathematics is constructed and has to be constructed on that basis, according to Brouwer, which is an active construction of thought. Only in this way can there be transparency of argument. In his brief essay, Aspects of Intuitionistic Modal Music, which was published in a booklet that accompanied Hennix's multimedia show, Brower's Lattice, of which the recorded performance of the electric harpsichord was one part, Hennix says, and this is a quote, maybe the most vivid of the modalities of modal music is the modality of infinity. The idea of the infinite refers to an unending process, thus drones already, right? i.e. a process without any conceivable end, reaching out towards the future while constantly leaving the past pulsing behind. Here one can find the basic substance of the intuition of time as it reveals itself in the most undisturbed form. But although time might be the most requisite part of music, there are nonetheless equally vivid and important vertical tactics of attention, each requiring its specific spectra of modalities, all of which unfold with the directed spreads of time. It is the liberation of the latter modalities that the creative subject constructs when he is subject to an activity involving the two basic acts of intuitionism. Here, the mind is cleaned from its excess garbage by controlled acts of intuitions and the vertical modalities crystallize out to abstract configurations of intentions and arrow diagrams. So that notion basically that all mathematics is a kind of um, deck of cards that actively has to be constructed in the form of an argument that emerges out of this contemplation of the experience of time that any subject has when they look into themselves in some sense. 
Note the way that the phenomenological cure, core of intuitionism, the awareness of time, becomes the basis of both mathematical and musical entities. Note also the importance of tactics of attention, implying practices by which the subject comes into being in relation to a non-linguistic non-knowledge. Note that in contrast to the apparent orientation of speculative philosophy towards a pervasive exteriority, the orientation here is towards an interiority that is non-correlationist. Because awareness is evolving or crystallizing, there is the sense in which a knowledge beyond correlation is being constructed iteratively. Quote from um, the whole inner self can be mapped onto modal structures, unquote, says Henix in an interview accompanying Brow's Lattice. Another quote. Um, what you get aware of by exposure to our music is awareness of general patterns. It is a purely abstract and private imprint, not a factual thing. And that is why I insist on claiming that music should open up new tactics of attention in which terms the audience can redevelop their ambiguously acquired modalities." Unquote. <clears throat> in her more recent writings, Hennix talks about this emergent property in terms of neuroplasticity and practices of, of attention that retune neurocognitive structures, allowing for further new kinds of attention and affect to emerge. I think it's worth dwelling on the word awareness and practices and modalities of awareness, because part of what is at stake in debates about correlationism is what is meant by a subject of awareness. What intrigues me about Hennig's commitment to intuitionism <clears throat> is the possibility of an interior exteriority, or put another way, a breaching of the limit of correlationism in inner rather than exterior space. At first, it sounds very solipsistic, but if intuitionist practices are to be presented and not just thought, then what they refuse is not external reality, or let's just say reality per se, but merely a discursively conceived public space that stands in for that. Two, the issue of space brings me to the second of Hennig's innovations in terms of an ontology of sound, topos theory, recently discussed by Alan Badiou in his Logics of Worlds, but already there in Hennig's work from the 1970s. The short version of Topos theory, and if you want to amuse yourself looking at internet attempts by mathematicians to give a short version of Topos theory, is a very humorous activity. <laughs> so this is even more humorous. <laughs> um, the short version of Topos theory is that it is a branch of category theory, and that when thinking about the ontology of mathematics in the light of different mathematical fields, such as algebra, geometry, set theory, etc., the question of the relation of these fields arises. In other words, set theory describes things, algebra describes things. Are they describing the same thing or not? Um, and mathematicians such as <coughs> Lauvert and Grotendieck, working after World War II, more or less described a set of tools that allow the transformation of these different mathematical fields into each other. A field, in this sense, corresponds to a category and or a topos. Badiou, applying these ideas <coughs> to philosophy, proposes toposes as logics of worlds, as an extension of his argument regarding mathematical ontologies. And he's shifted from ontology to ontologies, right? Because it's plural now. For Hennix, a musical composition, defined in her terms as intuitionistic noggle music, involving the construction of a scale, rules for moving around within the scale, and the act of improvising a specific performance within the logic of that structure is a topos. The blues, in this sense, is a topos, and Hennix explicitly says that. Raga Multani is a topos. In the Brower's Lattice interview, Hennix emphasizes that, quote, we aim at evolving frames of musical structures 
rather than trying to obtain completeness. Okay. The creative subject develops a topos, a mathematical ontological frame. Freedom consists in the ability to manifest such frameworks as life worlds. Concerning long duration works, Hennig says, quote, length has to do with space in society. How much space can be taken up by musical performance? Our long performance styles are very good pedagogic examples of overcoming the obstacles existing for freedom in our society. This is how musical performance connects with ethics. There are obstructions for these long style performances and our music documents the overcoming of these obstacles. Unquote. Again, this suggests the way in which there is an interest in politics to Hennix's work, which becomes something like a calculated phenomenology, to use an expression of bad use, also from Logics of World. And, you know, just to um, spell that out again, a calculated phenomenology would be a mathematical phenomenology, would be an experiential mathematics, if you can wrap your head around that. <laughs> it's produced by a logic, and it, but it also appears phenomenologically as experience. Um, Henry Flint has a beautiful paragraph about the aesthetic, scientific, political implications of Hennig's practices in his notes on the electric harpsichord. It's a quote. These projects had a common feature which traces back to the culture of tuning championed by Lamont Young. The thrust of modern technology was to transfer the human act to the machine, to eliminate the human in favor of the machine, to study phenomena contrived to be independent of how humans perceive them. So more or less Mela Su's argument about correlationship, co correlationism right there. In contrast, the culture of tuning which Jung transmitted by example to his acolytes let conscious discernment of an external process define the phenomenon. The next step is to seek the laws of conscious discernment or recognition of the process. And the next step is to invent a system driven by improvisation, monitored by conscious aperception of the process. End of quote. This argument formed the basis of Flint's 1979 collaborations with Hennix on hallucinatory ecstatic sound environments or illuminatory sound environments at the kitchen in New York City. And maybe some of you saw the reconstruction of these in Brooklyn uh, issue project room this, this last summer. It's kind of an amazing event. Um, they also described the sound and light installations known as dream houses made by Lamont Young and Marion Cecilia in the 1960s. In the abstract, these kinds of meta-musical frameworks might appear at best tautological and at worst, an irritating attempt at scoring a theoretical home run around the historicity of actually existing musical practices and the challenges that come with participating in them. But Flint and Hennix's argument is not merely meta-descriptive. It both describes what music is and sets it within a framework that allows for a radically expanded definition of what music can or could be while also prescribing rules that define the success or failure of particular experiments at producing sonic toposes or compositions. Again, what's interesting in this model is a kind of non-correlationist theory of the subject, driven by an evolving concept of practice and improvisation within specifically articulated frameworks, aka toposes. A final quote from Flynn, again, and from his essay on Hennix. The state of consciousness that matters for philosophy is an exceptional state, and it has to be attained. Hennix delineates this state with a logical theory. Thank you.